like to start the presentation by introducing myself. My name is Ariella Harris. I am a board certified behavior analyst at Shema Kaleinu. Shema Kaleinu is a school and center for children with autism and we are located in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'd also like to add that this presentation today is a free workshop that was able to be made by the New York City Council of Autism Initiative. So let's go ahead and start. So today's topic is the principles of behavior, of verbal behavior. Um, I just want to start off my presentation by asking um, my audience, how many, how many of you have heard of verbal behavior? I just would like to know um, how many of you have been exposed to this term our behavior analysts, behavior therapists are actually in the field. So I'm just gonna go ahead and look at my chat. So I see a lot of you have heard this term before and you're familiar with what verbal behavior actually means. Some of you. Okay, great. Okay, so today's presentation is going to be about the history of verbal behavior, I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to where verbal behavior came from and who it was introduced by, what the meaning of verbal behavior is, what the relationship between verbal behavior and ABA is. I'm going to define and explain the primary verbal operands, which are the different categories of language according to B.F. Skinner, and I'm going to describe the basic components of the VB map. The VB map stands for verbal behavior milestones and placements assessment. And that is the assessment that we use to analyze children's goals and curriculum guides. So a little bit of background about verbal behavior. B.F. Skinner published Verbal Behavior in 1957. It proved to be his most important work for children with autism who are acquiring communication skills. So basically what verbal behavior is, it was a theoretical approach on how language helps with communication skills. It was written to analyze language from a behavioral perspective and the impact that language has on a person's environment. What can I do and say that will get me something from my environment? Skinner was primarily interested in how and why a speaker says what they say. So why do we use words? What does it get us? And how are words useful in getting what we want and communicating with others? He separated the formal units of language into categories known as verbal operands. So he took language and he just, he broke it up into pieces and he categorized it into different types and how we acquire language. Another pioneer in verbal behavior was Jack Michael. He basically took Skinner's book and simplified it and analyzed it. So we would get a basic knowledge of what verbal behavior was. Because if you would ask anyone who's actually read the book or looked through it, it's very hard to understand it. It's very theoretical. And the words, frankly, for me, are very hard to understand. So he really broke it down. And a lot of the terms that he broke it down to are terms that we use every day in verbal behavior. So Jack Michael's research and writing created a foundation of work often utilized in the field of verbal behavior and applied behavior analysis. So he really took Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior and ABA and further analyzed it for us behavior analysts to so get a better understanding of how verbal behavior works in common language and terms. He published a textbook, Concepts and Principles of Behavior Analysis, which is considered necessary reading for anyone who's interested in fever ABA. So if anyone's interested in further analysis of Skinner's behavior analysis and verbal behavior, I would recommend reading this book whenever you have a chance. So what is verbal behavior? That's a topic of this presentation. So verbal behavior is any behavior that communicates our needs or wants to someone else. It's anything that gets us something from someone else. It is established and maintained through reinforcement and mediated by another person. So if I ask for something, I need to receive it from someone else. So someone else needs to reinforce my behavior. It is based on the idea that the meaning of a word is found in its functions. So according to Skinner, he believes that one word could have many functions. And we'll go ahead and talk about that in the later slides. It could include speaking, pointing, sign language, writing, using picture exchange systems, and are using various augmentative communication devices. So there's a misconception that verbal only means vocal. And according to Skinner, 
behavior could come in many different forms. So it could be speaking, pointing, sign language, writing, like I said, or using um, AC communication device. So if you have a child who is nonverbal, but they can point to something they want, that is considered verbal behavior. If you have a child who is using an AC device in order to communicate, that is considered verbal behavior. It doesn't only have to be vocal. It is the belief that language is understood through learning the verbal operants, which are the basic units of analysis of language. So like I stated before, he took language and he broke it up into categories of different types. And we're gonna go ahead and discuss that in the later slides. So a continuation of verbal behavior. Verbal behavior is one aspect of applied behavior analysis. So ABA, in short, is analysis and application of behavior principles to modify behavior. It's everything that we do in the environment in order to either change or, or increase behavior. And we, and some of the principles used in ABA are also used in verbal behavior. And those include discrete trial training. In short, we call it DTT. It's instructional method of systematically introducing new skills by breaking larger skills into smaller, more attainable goals. So when we work with our children with autism, the first thing we do, we're not gonna go ahead and try to teach them 10 words at a time. We're going to go ahead and break that skill into smaller, attainable, and achievable goals. So we might start with a sound and build on that sound. Or if they have vocal skills, we might teach them one word at a time and then build from there. Another important principle in verbal behavior is reinforcement. And that is the, let me just move my thing, an increase in a behavior occurring again. In order for a behavior to occur, reoccur, you need reinforcement. You have to be able to reinforce that child's behavior in order for them to ask for something in the future. If a child is constantly asking for candy and you say no, most likely they're not gonna ask for candy anymore. But if a child asks for candy and you say yes and you give it to them, th that behavior will likely recur in the future. In the future, So you're increasing their communication and language skills by giving them the candy. Even though I know most parents don't wanna give their child candy, but a lot of times it really does help with language and communication skills in order to get that language out of them. So what does verbal behavior look like? According to B.F. Skinner, nonverbal behavior is if someone wants water, they'll walk to the refrigerator and get water. He doesn't consider that verbal behavior because that's direct reinforcement for yourself. There is no mediation between two people. You don't have two people involved. In order for verbal behavior to occur, you need to have an exchange between two people. So what he does consider verbal behavior is if someone wants water, they'll say water and someone delivers the water to them. That is an exchange between two people. Someone asks for water and someone else reinforces that language and gives them the water. Wants water, signs water, someone delivers water. That is also considered verbal behavior. It just might not be vocal. Someone wants water, they point to water, someone delivers water. According to Skinner, that is also considered verbal behavior. Wants water, ex exchanges a picture of water, and someone delivers water. That is also considered verbal behavior. Want water, writes water, someone delivers water. That's also considered verbal behavior. So according to Skin, in order for, in order for verbal behavior to occur, you need to have two people, a speaker and a listener. In this case, the child is usually the speaker because he's the one using language and asking the listener, which is the adult, um, for something. So verbal behavior can only take place when there is a social interaction between two people, a speaker and a listener. The speaker engages in verbal behavior in any modality they choose. So like I said in the previous slide, it doesn't only have to be vocal. Verbal behavior comes in many different forms. The listener responds to the verbal behavior. Skinner also states that now our responses to an environment involve verbal behavior. So Skinner also wants us to be aware that getting a toy from the shelf or turning on the lights or opening a door is, is not considered verbal behavior because that is direct reinforcement for yourself. So in order for verbal behavior to occur, it needs to happen between two people. Okay, so um, this slide talks about the relationship between ABA and verbal behavior. A lot of ABA and verbal behavior programs work together. So in ABA, we, we're teaching um, children with autism different skills, but we're also incorporating language with those skills. So some similarities include 
all skills are systematically taught in a specific order. So for both AB and VB, our skills are, are taught in a specific order. Teachers pair themselves with preferred items and activities to make interactions reinforcing. We always want to pair ourselves as a reinforcer. We want to make learning fun. Data about learner progress is collected on a regular basis and used to make decisions about a mastery and guide problem solving. So everything we do in AB and verbal behavior is surrounded by data. We analyze our data to make sure that our children are learning, acquiring skills, and are acquiring language. Um, just a continuation of some similarities. They are both research and evidence-based. Everything we know about AB and verbal behavior is, has been tested and proved to be significantly successful. Progress is measured in terms of observable behavior. In order for verbal behavior to, in order for verbal behavior to be seen, you have to be able to observe it, and by more than one person. There are written protocols describing how programs are taught and carried out. Ongoing hands-on systematic training is provided for teachers and therapists by a behavior analyst. So why do we use verbal behavior? Why is it so important in teaching children with autism? First reason is it focuses primarily on the child developing a functional form of communication and language skills. We are trying to build communication and language skills around the child with autism that might have very limited or no communication skills. Teaches children that language is useful and meaningful. Through verbal behavior, children are learning Oh, wow, if I ask for something, I get it. I have control over my environment, and that gives them independence and motivation to communicate. It teaches the skills necessary to be successful in various settings and situations. So what that means is we want our students to be successful at school, but we also want them to be successful at home. As behavior analysts, I think it's very important for a child to be able to ask for something at school, but also be able to ask for that at home. Okay, so when it comes to verbal behavior, where do we start? So the first thing we must understand is reinforcement. So what is a reinforcer? A reinforcement is any item or event that increases the rate of a behavior when it is presented following such behaviors. So a reinforcer is anything that is a tangible item. So if a child asks for milk and a parent gives them milk, the reinforcer is the milk. Reinforcers are individualized and specific to each person. You can assume that you know what your child or student wants. It's individualized and specific to that person. I have a, I'll just give you a personal example. I have a 15 month old daughter and I always assume I know what she wants to eat for breakfast. And everything I give her, she'll say, no, no, no. So I have to physically pick her up, take her to the pantry and she points to what she wants. So as a mother, I can assume that I know what she wants for breakfast. I need to give her that choice. Um, the key is to remember what reinforces the learner, not what reinforces us, or what we think should be reinforcing to the learner. Like I said before, we can't just assume we know what a child wants. We have to be able to give them that choice and that access and that freedom to be able to communicate their wants and needs. So there are different types of reinforcement. There's social, which is social praise, high five, hugs, kisses, good job. There's activity, a lot of children work for coloring, uh, paints, going outside, going to the park, tangibles. Um, these include specific items like toys or food, token economy. We use this more for higher functioning kids with autism, advanced learners. They have a certain amount of tokens. They go ahead and exchange it for an activity or a reinforcer. And sensory, a lot of children that I work for the reinforcers are sensory input. <laughs> okay, so this is a poll question. I like to um, ask my attendees, what types of reinforcements do you use most in your classroom and with your students? So if you could just go ahead and answer in the chat box. All right, I see a lot of different answers. I like it. There's a variety of reinforcers that you guys are using in your classes. That's great. Thank you everyone for answering. So typically I work with lower functioning students. So the reinforcers that my students ask for are sensory, tangibles, or um, social engagement, hugs, kisses, things like that. 
but that was great. Thank you guys for sharing. So rules of reinforcement. Um, reinforcers need to be powerful. You wanna make sure that the reinforcers that you're using for your students are powerful enough to motivate them to learn, engage, and be able to use language properly. You wanna reinforce only when a target behavior occurs. You wanna pair specific praise with reinforcers. A lot of times when you're giving um, a candy, you want to pair with a social praise like, good job, hooray, I'm so proud of you. And let me just move my chat box. When teaching a new skill, reinforcement should occur immediately after each correct response. So like I was saying before, especially when it comes to verbal behavior, if a child is asking for, I'll just give you um, an example, my daughter would ask for raisin, she loves raisins, when she asks for reasons, I give it to her right away. I want to reinforce her, her language, and I want to teach her that if she asks for something, she gets it. So in the future, my daughter will likely ask for reason again, and that will increase and motivate her to speak and use her words. Establish a variable or intermittent reinforcement schedule as closely as possible. So basically what that means is you don't always want to reinforce your child for asking for um, a raisin or asking for a toy. Some of these things are, you know, they should be natural. So what that means is you want to, you don't want to be predictable. Um, a reinforcement tip that I tell my, my staff is you want to save the best reinforcer for the best behavior or the hardest work. Now I always say this, especially with when you're teaching ch small children or early learners communication skills, language, a lot of times they don't want to talk and they don't want to communicate and they just want what they want and they don't want to have to work for it. So whatever reinforcer you're using, make sure it's a reinforcer that they really, really want. Um, just a side note, um, note also the difficulty of the response will also affect the level of motivation. While an item may be sufficiently reinforcing for an easy response, it might not be worth it for a more difficult response. So just like I said before, you wanna make sure that your, reinfor your reinforcers are powerful for your students. Without a powerful reinforcement, they're more likely you know, not gonna work and not gonna to wanna to communicate. Hi, this is Sasha from theautismhelper.com. Here's a quick tutorial on using the I am working for system and choice board. Um, so here I have a few of the students' preferable items or common items preferred in our class. And when the student comes to the station, I keep actually one right at every station, and they can pick what they want to work for. So if he wants to work for Cheetos, he puts it here. Um, and then it depends on the kid. Sometimes after a few responses, we'll give a star, or after one task, we'll give a star. The stars are kept on the back, which I think is so important, or else, honestly, you lose them. So once the child does something good or if we're using this for behavior, academics, give one star and kind of continue on doing that until you have get all the stars all up to the end. And once they get stars up to the end, they get the Cheetos. This is a nice visual way to break down the reinforcement the child's getting. And I think this really helps kids with autism understand more intermittent reinforcement. They don't get the Cheeto every time they do the response, but they know that it's coming. Um, thanks for watching, and for more tips, resources, and materials, come to theautismhelper.com. Thanks. But this video is on reinforcement. It's, it's a token economy. It's for higher um, functioning students. They are working for um, Cheeto with a chip, so they are working for getting five tokens. Once they get their five tokens, they hand it in, and in exchange, they'll get um, a Cheeto, which is a stack. Okay, so another principle of verbal behavior that we use every day as behavior analysts is discrete trial training, which is also known as DTT. It's a teaching method that breaks down a larger goal into smaller, simplified, and structured steps. So discrete trial training is broken down into three steps. The first one is a discriminative stimulus, which is basically the instruction, the demand or event that serves as a signal to someone that there is something they need to respond. A response is the actual behavior of the student and the consequence. So this is an example of what a discrete trial looks like. Verbal instruction, a teacher said, what is it? She holds up um, a card and shows a student a picture of a dog. The student responds and says dog. The reinforcement is high five. So for this student, he's working for social praise.
Unit 3, Discrete Trial Teaching. Section 1, The Discrete Trial, SD, and Response. In DTT, the discrete trial is used to teach new behaviors. The definition of a discrete trial is presenting a learning opportunity in which the student's correct response will be reinforced. The discrete trial consists of three parts which correspond to the ABCs of behavior. These parts are the discriminative stimulus, or SD, the response, or R, and the stimulus reinforcer, or SR. Here's an example of a discrete trial. Look at me. Good looking! High five! As you saw, the SD was the instructor saying, look at me. The response was the student looking at the instructor. And the stimulus reinforcers were the instructor saying, good looking, giving a food treat and high-fiving the student. Okay, so now we're getting into the good stuff. Um, the verbal operants according to Skinner's VB model. Skinner breaks down language into various types and various categories. And we're gonna go ahead and talk about each category of language. So the first category is an echoic. What is an echoic? Some of you might have heard of it. So for some of you it might be a new term. It's a type of language where a speaker repeats the words of another speaker, repeating precisely what is heard usually immediately. So I'll give you an example. If I say mommy, my expectation is that child says the word mommy. If I say daddy, my expectation is that child has to imitate vocally the same word daddy. That is considered an echoic. Echoics are really important because they are the foundation of imitating and vocally being able to express themselves. Amand is a type of language where a speaker asks for what he wants or needs. Man's requesting objects, assistance, information, removal of a stimulus. The next one we have is a tact, um, a type of language where a speaker names things, actions, and events in his immediate natural environment, labeling caretakers' names, toys, common household items. So for example, if you're walking in the street with your child or your student, and a child points to a car that is considered a tact, it's a label. They are labeling items in an environment. And the response you would get from a parent or teacher would be, good job, yes, that is a car. Interverbals, um, these are more complex. These are more for higher um, level learners. These are for learners who have more language. It's a type of language where a speaker verbally responds to the words of others that is strengthened by social reinforcement without any visual stimuli present, having a conversation or answering questions about something not present. Um, for example, talking about a bike without seeing a bike or a picture of a bike. So, introverbals are, they could go anywhere, they could be anywhere from having conversations, fill-ins, being able to, being able to uh, label a feature function of an item. So, this is a little bit more advanced. Once they have the echoic man tag repertoire, we can go ahead and move on to introverbals. Receptive. It's a type of language where the listener follows commands and understands what is said to them, following directions, identifying items. So if you have an array of three items, you might say point to the car, point to the phone, point to the water. Um, another receptive skill can be go get me the car from the shelf or go wash your hands or um, go get your lunch. So these are all receptive skills that you might see in a preschool classroom. Imitation is a type of language where the listener copies the actions of another person repeating the action of another person. So if I say, do this, and I go ahead and clap my hands, my expectation is that the child would go ahead and imitate me and clap his hands. So according to um, Skinner, one word can have many functions. And I went ahead and broke it down to you. So I took a simple word like apple, and I broke it down into different functions that the word apple might have. Now, for an echoic, when you hear the word apple, you'll say apple. For a man, it's when you're hungry and you want an apple. For a tact, it's when you see, smell, taste, or touch an apple. Interverbal is you might have a conversation describing what an apple looks like, what it, what it feels like, what it tastes like. Receptive is you might have an array of three items and a, and a teacher will tell you point to the apple. An imitation is 
when you point to a picture of an apple because somebody else did the same. So I might say, do this, point to the picture of an apple with my pointer finger, and I would have the child do the same. So this is how we could take the word apple and break it down into different categories of language. Okay, so the verbal operant that we're gonna talk about first is in a colic. Occurs in response to the verbal behavior of another person. So it's vocal imitation echoing the, echoing the words of another person. So like I said before, if I say phone, my expectation is that my student will say the exact word phone. Now, a lot of times for early learners, they don't have the, the, the vocal repertoire to say the word phone. So I would go ahead and reinforce whatever sound they give me. So they will learn that communication is a good thing. It's a positive thing. And so I can reinforce that. So in the future, they will go ahead and imitate more of my sounds. There is point to point correspondence. What that means is if mom says car, the child says car. They have to sound exactly the same. Um, there is formal similarity. Both responses physically resemble each other. So if I say car vocally, the child has to say car vocally. Um, if I sign car, they have to sign car. So it has to, the formality, the physicality has to look the same. This can occur in many forms such as sign language, AC devices, vocal, writing, and typing. Um, an example of an echoic that you might see in a early learning program would be Verbal stimulus, someone says cookie, the behavior is the child says cookie, and the consequence is social praise. Um, like I said, a coex, they have point to point correspondence, they can occur in many forms, in forms, they could be vocal, you could be using sign language, AC devices, which are communication devices um, that um, some of our students may use to communicate, and writing and typing. Um, sample of an echoic program that you might see um, in an ABA verbal behavior program can look like, like this. You have a long-term objective. The student will imitate any two word utterances with 90% accuracy. Possible short-term objectives. We always want to start with, with short-term objectives and work towards a long-term objective. So the first one would be imitates one word CVC utterances like cat, imitates one word CCVC utterances like chat, imitates two word um, CVC utterance like cat and had, um, imitates two words CCVC, chat and shop. Now for an early learner, you might see, you, you, you would see something simpler than this. You might see imitate um, one, one sound like a ka, then maybe two sounds, three sounds, four sounds. So like I said, verbal behavior, each program is really individualized for that specific learner. And it also depends on their, their functioning level. Um, goals related to a coics. Um, there is an early COEX skills assessment that we use for our students, which you find, which you could find in the VB map. Group one is simple and reduplicated syllables. They look like this: ma, da, mama. Simple, easy, more babbling, more jargon. Group two is syllable combinations: daddy, mommy. Group three is three syllable combinations: go, bye, bye. Group four is prosody. You're looking at their tone, their rhythm, um, their yeah, group five is you're looking at their picked or loudest in duration. So this assessment could be found in the VB map and we assess all our students um, in order to see what kind of curriculum and what kind of a co-wake build up we can give them in their individualized portfolios. Okay, so 
so verbal operand mand. What is a mand? It's a type of verbal operand in which a speaker requests for what he needs or wants. Um, a great way to remember it is command, demand, that's how I remember it. The verbal response is under the functional control of motiv motivating operations and specific reinforcement. What that means is you're not gonna ask for something that you don't want. If you're hungry, you'll ask for candy. If you're tired, you'll ask to go to sleep. If you're thirsty, you'll ask for water. So it's a request for something, for something that you want, that you need, that you desire. Primarily the first verbal operand is acquired by child. Um, this is true, many of our students, this is the first verbal operand that they acquire because in order for them to navigate and maneuver through their surroundings, they need to be able to communicate a request for what they want. Um, the only operand that directly benefits a child, mans can come in various forms, speaking, pointing, writing, typing, signing, and finger spelling. It can be used to request desired items, attention, information, assistance, or actions. So manding doesn't necessarily mean requesting for, for food or for, for one item. You can man for information, you can man for actions. I'm gonna go outside and play. Um, I wanna know um, what we are doing today. So those are all different types of mans that you can possibly see in, in your students. Um, manding, this is an example of what a man would look like, um, communicating wants and needs, use the student's motivation to teach, student can control the environment. Um, antecedent, so child is really, child wakes up, he's really hungry, the first thing he asks for is cookie. I mean, that shouldn't be the first thing he asks for, but he might. Consequence is parent gives him a cookie. Five reasons to teach manning. So I tell all my staff, when I have a new preschool student, the first thing we have to teach them is how to communicate, how to navigate through the environment, and how to be able to be independent in their own surroundings. So the first reason to teach manding is children learn that talking is valuable. The child learns that if I talk and my life gets better immediately, when a child wants to play ball, a child will say ball and the ball is delivered, the reinforcement is specific and timely. So a child is learning that, oh, hey, if I say something, I actually get it. And that's great because he'll be reinforced and motivated to continue using his words and language and communicating his wants and needs. Um, a continuation is by teaching the man, you will be replacing problem behavior with functional communication. So for example, if a child has a history of getting milk only when he's crying, he will continue to cry to get milk in the future. However, if a child learns that saying or signing milk is more effective and efficient at getting milk, it is likely that the crying will be replaced with manning. So this is very true, especially as a behavior analyst. I have a lot of students who come into my school and they have no means of communicating and they are so frustrated with themselves because they clearly want something in their head but they have no way of letting us know what they want and for a new student it's very hard to guess what they want so that's why manding is so important because you're replacing it you're giving them functional communication you're giving them independence in order to ask for things and to communicate and realize that hey if i ask for something i get it i should really continue to use my words and that will replace crying, screaming, or any sort of behavioral um, behavior that you know, a child may have due to lack of language skills. Another reason to teach manning is teacher and caregivers performing manning sessions become paired with reinforcement. So what this means is during manning sessions, the child is constantly accessing reinforcement through caregivers and teachers. This will pair those people with reinforcement and make the child want to approach them frequently. So for example, a child will learn, hey, if I'm, gonna, if I'm asking my teacher for toys and she's giving it to me, she's so fun, of course I wanna go ahead and play with her. So you want, the first thing you wanna do, especially with a new child is you wanna pair yourself as a reinforcer. You wanna make yourself fun. You wanna make communication fun. You don't, wanna be, you don't want it to be a stressful thing for a child to do. You wanna make it easy. Instead of learning, when my teacher comes to my house, all she does is ask me questions and make my life more difficult. The child will learn that when my teacher comes to my house, my life gets more fun and I get to play with all my favorite toys. So at that point, you're pairing yourself and reinforcer and a child will want to communicate with you and will want to use language. Another reason to teach manning is a child may start to like a wider variety of toys and activities. Because manning sessions involve making the activities and games motivating for the child, the child may come to enjoy a wider repertoire of toys and activities when he's exposed to them. 
a lot of students, and I've seen from my experience, are obsessed with one thing. Now I can give you an example of some of my students and even my daughter are obsessed with baby shark. That's all she wants to play with. Her baby shark stuffed animals, her baby shark, she always wants to listen to is baby shark music. But when I expose her to different other songs and different um, stuffed animals, she's like, oh, wow, this is a great song and this stuffed animal is really cute and I want to play with it. So you want to go ahead and expand that repertoire of toys for your students so they will be able to mend for other things than Baby Shark. Um, another reason to teach manning is it's the foundation of conversational skills. Manning is not just asking for items that you want. As children develop more language, mans become more complex. So an example that I gave here is as a child acquires a larger verbal repertoire, they will start manning for information, which is asking questions. In this case, information is the reinforcer. By teaching basic manding, we're building a foundation to learn more complex man. So like I said before, manding is not just I want candy, I get candy. I want milk, I get milk. I want a toy, I get the milk. But it also builds up on conversational skills as higher, as higher level skills develop. Um, manding for information, information, manding for um, different, you know, different objects or different activities, and eventually later we'll build up the conversational skills. Um, rules for teaching manding, you want to, um, teaching must occur in a natural and everyday environment where the motivation is typically strong. You want to capture and contrive as many opportunities per day to teach manding. You want to get the best quality response with the least amount of prompting. You really don't want to consistently prompt your child to communicate um, and use language. You want them to be spontaneous and independent. You might do this in the beginning, but eventually the goal is to lesser the prompts and make them more independent and spontaneous talkers throughout their environment. You want to be the giver, not the taker. You want to select words for mans that are reinforcers, and you want to be, you want to, consistency with all teaching staff is essential with lots of opportunities for generalization. So what that means is you want to make sure that if you're teaching a skill in the classroom, if you're teaching a child to say chips in the classroom, you want them to be able to say chips in different parts of the building or, or with different therapists and also with, um, parents or different or caregivers. So there are requests related to mans. These include requests for desired items. I want pizza for dinner. Requests for information. What time is it? Requests for assistance. Can, can you help me? These are all different types of mans. Requests for missing items. So given a bowl filled with cereal and milk, you might say, mom, I need a spoon or teacher, I need a spoon. Request for actions, play with me, request for attention, look what I'm doing. Request to remove something is turn off that loud music, I can't take it anymore. So these are all different types of mans. And depending on the student, um, you'll see you know, what their capabilities are. Um, a sample of a verbal behavior man program that you might see um, in a verbal behavior program might be student will man for cookie with a full sentence. So a short term objective would be if you're teaching a child to be able to request for cookies, um, three coax five mans. So what three coax five mans means is you're vocally giving them the word and then you're waiting for them, for mans is you're waiting for them to spontaneously say the word cookie on their own. Mans for want cookie with three coax to five mans. Mans for I want cookie with three coax to five mans. And mans for I want cookie please with three coax to five mans. Um, examples of contriving um, a motivating operation, which just means how do we get a child to, motivated to be able to use language throughout their environment. A lot of times you'd have to start with something simple like holding up an M&M within an eyesight of the child, giving the child a bottle with a tight lid and, have, and having them request to open it, giving the child a bowl of cereal with a little spoon and having them request a spoon in order to be able to eat their cereal. Giving the child a toy that requires batteries, but with holding the batteries. So you might give a child batteries and you want them to be able to use their words and their language and tell you, hey, this needs batteries. Turning off his favorite video, saying, mom, let's turn this off. Or giving a child a piece of paper with no crane and having the child say, mom, I need a crane in order to color. Um, another thing about mans, um, there's two sets of mans. There's a pure mans and an impure mans. Pure mans is often called spontaneous mans. So if a child 
spontaneously says to you, you're out at the store and, and a child spontaneously says to you, um, can I have a chip? That would be considered a pure mand. Mands that occur when the desired item is not present. There's no chip in sight. The child is just hungry. Impure mans is, it does not occur spontaneously. Mans that occur in the presence of the item or prompted by another person. Um, an impure man would look like if I hold up a chip and the child sees a chip, chip and then asks for a chip, that's an impure man. The prompt is showing the child that there's a chip in my hand. So you might start with impure mans, but the goal is to really um, get spontaneous language from our students. At the Verbal Behavior Center for Autism, we teach our children to communicate using what we call a MAND repertoire. MANDs are essentially asking or requesting for what you want. Oftentimes, children start off with one word utterances, and the goal is for the child to MAND using full sentences to communicate like you and I do. Here, Roshni is using an iPad. Several pictures have been taken of preferred items or activities that are available to Roshni. When Roshni's motivation is high for one of these items, she scrolls through the pictures, taps on one, and then hands the iPad to her therapist, who now knows what Roshni wants. Before her therapist gives Roshni the requested item, she will be required to make a vocal approximation of the word, in this case, ball, so that eventually the use of the iPad may be eliminated. All right, come here. Ooh, jump off, big jump. Very nice, what do you want? I want to jump on the turbo. Go for it. Ben has learned to man using full sentences. Previously, he would man using only one word, There's jump, for funny. example. Then his man increased to two words, want jump. Now he can successfully communicate his wants and needs with jump, full sentences. Jump. As you saw, at the Verbal Behavior Center for Autism, we teach our children to man. Manding is extremely beneficial for children all along the autism spectrum, from low functioning to high functioning. For more information about manding and our program, please visit vbca.org. So this slide is just, just a fun slide of let's test ourselves. We learned about some of the verbal operands. A child says out to get someone to open the door. What do we all think it is? Backspace. Let's go ahead and look at the chat. Great. Yes. Let's consider them in. Um, okay, great. Yes, it is considered a man. Let's do the next one together. A child cleans up when their um, their toys when asked to clean up. What would that be considered? I don't think we touched upon that yet, but let's all know that. Right, it is receptive. You're giving a child a command. You're giving them a verbal instruction, and they have to go ahead and follow it. Great, nice work, everyone. Great job. You guys are all getting it right, 100%. Let's do the third one. A child says ball when they see a ball on the street. Great, everyone's getting it right so far. It is attacked. So a child sees an object in the street. He yells at his mom, it's a ball. Mom says, yes, you're right, that is a ball.
Let's do the fourth one. A child says cookie when they are hungry. That should be an easy one because all of my examples are about food. I must be very hungry right now. Great job. That is a mand. Great, great job, everyone. Um, a child answers questions about the weather. Great, pretty impressive. I didn't even go through that yet, but it is an introverbal. That's great. Let's do the last one together. A child walks away when someone is bothering them. Great, that was a tricky one. That is not considered vulgar behavior. There is no exchange between a speaker or a listener. That was a little tricky. Great job, everyone. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Now we're gonna talk about, let me just get my chat box out. Oh no, what'd I do? Okay, uh, verbal operant tact. Now we're gonna talk about what a tact is. It's a type of verbal operant in which the response is controlled by an immediate nonverbal stimulus in the environment. So for example, a boy screams train, a parent will say, yes, you're right, that is a train. Produces a generalized condition reinforcement, such as social praise. You're not getting anything tangible. When you say train, you're not actually getting a train, but you are getting social praise from a parent or a teacher. A speaker, a speaker names objects, actions, or events in their direct contact through any of the sense modalities, smell, hear, touch. So you might be on the street with your child or your student. You might smell a flower. You could say flower. The parent or teacher will say, yes, you're right. That is a flower. It smells like flower. Um, you could hear a car going by. A child says car. The parent or teacher will say, yes, you're right. That is a car. Um, you may touch something on the street. Um, and parents will reinforce and say, yes, you're right, that is whatever you touched on the street. Skinner wrote that this was the most important operant where a child has direct contact with the environment. So he thought this operant is very important because this gives the child direct contact with the environment. They get to label items in their environment and also it builds up their vocabulary. Response forms include speaking, writing, typing, and signing. The importance of teaching tax. Allows speaker to identify and describe features of her environment. Um, like I said before, really gives a child um, a wider verbal repertoire and a vocabulary in order to engage in their own environment. There is a large number of words that can be learned through the environment. There's so much to see and so much out there um, where vocabulary and language is built. Most earlier intervention language programs focus on teaching this operant extensively to build vocabulary. This is what a tact looks like. The antecedent, which is the instruction. Um, a child sees or smells a cookie. Behavior is a child says cookie. The consequence is social praise. So when, when it comes to a tact, you're not getting the physical cookie. You are just labeling um, a picture of or describing or seeing um, a cookie. There are different types of tacks. Um, they include labeling objects, things, places, people, labeling actions, walking, eating, drinking, labeling features of objects. These include colors, sizes, textures, labeling relationships, slow, fast, big or small, opposites, 
labeling functions of objects, what an item is used for, and labeling a class of objects, so clothing, food, animals. So an example would be if you have a pile of, clo um, pile of clothing, um, you might ask a child, um, what category is this? A child will say clothing, you have a pile of food, what category is this? A child will say food, you have a um, um, pile of animals. You might ask a child, oh, what category is this? They will go ahead and say animals. A sample of a tacting program that you might see in um, an A behavior, verbal behavior program is tacting categories. Student will label eight categories with 90% accuracy. The short-term objectives, you want to start with, you might start with clothing animals, food, toys, shapes, colors, letters, numbers. At the Verbal Behavior Center for Autism, we teach our children to communicate by teaching them a tacting repertoire. Tacting is labeling, so our children then learn to label things in their environment, and that is oftentimes the first step in establishing conversational skills which help children to communicate with people in their environment. Good. My TV. There you go. Good. Good. Perfect. Bunny. Very nice. And a cat. Nice job, bud. Here, Ben is being shown several pictures of things he will see in his everyday life. He has learned how to tact or label each of these pictures. The ultimate goal is for Ben to label what he sees when he sees it. Labeling items is one of the first steps in conversation building. All right, I want you to look up here. What letter is it? A. Mm -hmm. How about this one? T. Mm -hmm. What about this one? O. Uh -huh. And what number is this? 71. Oh, what is it? Here, Sam is learning to tact or label letters and numbers. The acquisition of letter and number identification helps to establish pre-academic skills, which will be beneficial for him in future school settings. As you saw, at the Verbal Behavior Center for Autism, we teach our children to tact. Tacting can be extremely effective in teaching children how to communicate with others in their environment regarding things that they see. For more information about tacting and our program, visit bbca.org. Another fun thing, let's test ourselves again. I always like asking these questions just to make sure everyone's following and if anyone has any questions, they can go ahead and ask now since I'm opening my chat box. Okay, so let's do the first one together. A child says taxi as a result of seeing a taxi. What would that be considered? Great job, it's a tax. They are labeling items in their environment. In this case, it would be the taxi. Great job, let's do the next one together. A child says taxi as a result of wanting a taxi. That's a mand, right? They're requesting, demanding, commanding to get a taxi. These are all ways to remember what a mand is. Good job, everyone, so far 100%. Let's do the next one together. A child signs cat as a result of seeing a cat in the street. Great job, everyone. That is considered a tact. And for tax, they don't have to be the same sense modality. One could be um, using sign language and one could be vocally. 
Great job. Let's do the next one. A child says window as a result of seeing a window. Great job, everyone. They're labeling items in their environment. In this case, it'd be a window. So remember for tacting, you think of labeling. Great job, everyone. Let's do the next one. A child opens a door as a result of someone asking her to open a door. Great job, it's receptive. It's a listener skill. Great job, everyone. The last one is a child describes what a cookie looks like, what their features are. Great job, it's an interval because you're describing something. It's conversational. Great job, everyone. We're going to go ahead and move on. Okay, interverbal. A type of verbal behavior with a response that is controlled by a verbal stimulus conversation. Taught when there is a tact repertoire and a man and many pure man. So you wouldn't start with an interverbal. That wouldn't be one of your first um, verbal operants you would you would use, you would start with something simpler like a coax, mans, tax, and then move on to interval, interverbals because they are for higher level learnings, for higher level learners and for more vocal and for students with vocal abilities. Often used as a fill in to response as one, two, and answering questions, also fill into songs, that's considered an interverbal, comprises most of conversational language. It's an exchange between two people, in this case it'd be um, a student and a teacher, um, a mother and, and their child. Possible response forms include speaking, writing, signing, and pointing. An example of an interverbal would look like this, the antecedent, which is the instruction. Someone says, what do you want to eat? The behavior is cookie. And the consequence is, oh, you want a cookie? Okay, so maybe later on today we'll be able to eat a cookie. But you're not getting that um, direct cookie when you are teaching an interval. Or another example could be, you're having a conversation with a student and a child may say, oh, I want a cookie. And you might say, oh, you know, I really want chips. Maybe we'll go ahead and get that later. So that would be considered um, an interval as well. Goals related to intervals include filling words from songs or phrases. Old MacDonald had a, a child or student might, be, might fill in the word farm. Answer personal information. What's your name? How old are you? Where do you live? What school do you go to? When's your birthday? How many siblings do you have? What are, what are their names? Those are all intervals that you may um, use with your, with your students or your children. Answer WH questions. Answer functional questions. Recall events when told, tell me what happened, or answer reading and listening comprehension questions. Sample of an interverbal program you might see, state's ID, long-term objective looks like this. Student will expressively state personal information with 90% accuracy. Possible short-term objectives, you might start with something like, what's your name, because that's pretty simple. Then you might ask them, where do you live? How old are you? What's your phone number? Um, what school do you go to? And what's your, sister, what's your sibling's name? Give me the one that has wheels. 
yours? What has wheels? Car. What has wheels? Car. What do you play with? Crayon. What do you build with? You build with? Blocks. You build with? Blocks. That's right. What do you want? Okay, so the next verbal operant would be imitation. This is not vocal imitation. This is physical imitation. You're physically imitating someone else's behavior. Copying someone's motor movements of tendencies to sign for Apple when someone else signs Apple. In order to learn any skill, a child must have an imitation repertoire because without imitation, it is nearly impossible to teach anything. This is especially true for teaching motor imitations that include oral, gross, and fine motor movements. Being able to imitate the behaviors of others may lead to appropriate vocalizations, play, and social interactions. All right, we've got our chips here. So I believe this is a last verbal operant. It's receptive. It's a person's understanding of what is said to them when following directions or complying with the request of others. An example would be getting an apple when asked to get an apple by someone else. Initially, we start with items the child can man for or tact, as well as simple instructions, come here, sit, clap, stand, or clean up. When teaching receptive skills, we want to teach the child to respond to a variety of antecedents. So what that means is, when you're teaching a child receptive language and you're teaching them to be able to point to an array of pictures, you want to be able to give them different, different instructions with different language. So you might say, touch the apple or find the apple or show me the apple or um, can you give me the apple or um, hand me the apple. You want to be able to vary it because you don't want them to memorize the one instruction that you give them. Okay, so receptive identification is the student discriminates and identifies stimuli by, stimuli by responding without talking or signing. So, for example, point to juice, the child will point to juice, good job, that's the juice. So that would be an example of receptive identification. It doesn't have to be vocal. What does it look like? Following instructions are complying with the requests of others. So this would be a... Um, something you might see in the home and in, in class when your teacher or your parent asks you to do something, go get me the spoon or go get me the book from the shelf. A tendency to, an example that I used was apple, a tendency to get an apple when someone asks um, an apple and someone asks for you for an apple. Um, another example that I put on here was antecedent is brush your teeth. The learner go, goes ahead and brushes his teeth on, an, on his own and the teacher and parent says, good job. That would be an example of receptive language. Receptive identification would be an example of that would be if you have an array of three cars and you have the child say and you ask the child, can you point to the toothpaste or can you point to the toothbrush? So there's a difference between receptive language and identification. 
I just want everyone to be aware that there's a slight difference in that. Noel, touch P. Good job touching P. Wait, sit down please. Two more tokens. Okay. So, assessment. The last part of this, of this presentation talks about assessment. How do we build a curriculum for each child? How do we know what man, what, how do we know where we could improve on a child's language? How do we know what kind of communication skills a child needs, right? We have a child who comes to your school and we have absolutely no idea what their skill is. So we, we need to assess them somehow. So we assess them using our assessment, which is the VB map. But I just wanted to share this with you, the importance of assessment. Assessments are responsible for individualized intervention programs. An initial assessment provides current level of skills from an individual. And assessments are really important because they tell us what the child's skill is currently and where we need to go from here. Ongoing assessment provides tracking and outcome data. With assessments, it allows us to track a child's progress and data and from there make um, our program goals. Ongoing assessment can guide program adjustments. If a child is not progressing and learning at a proper rate, we, we go ahead and adjust the programs to make sure that they, you know, they are going to be learning and gaining language and gaining skills. Failure to conduct adequate assessment can result in an appropriate and ineffective curriculum for a child. We want our students to learn and progress, and we have to make sure that our assessments are done frequently to make sure that they are progressing and that the curriculum that we provide to them is individualized and working for their specific needs. Hi, I'm Jesse Franco. I'm the Executive Director at Autism Community Network in San Antonio. And I would like to invite you to a workshop that we're having in January um, on the VB map. The VB map stands for the Verbal Behavior Milestone and Ass Assessment and Placement Program. And this is a really awesome assessment that parents can use, teachers can use, therapists can use. Um, you're able to evaluate different areas of the child's learning um, across development. So for example, you would look at what, what should we expect developmentally for that child's requesting skills, or labeling skills, or social skills. Um, and then from there, that will be the first day of the workshop, we'll be looking at how you use that assessment to evaluate where a child is with their milestone or their development. Um, the second day will be spent on, okay, well based on that, how do we teach? So what do we teach and how do we teach the skills that they're missing? So for example, developmentally, we can find gaps that they might be missing with their play skills. So how do we go in and then teach those play skills? Um, so we'll be covering that the second day. The third day, we'll be looking at the barriers assessment, which is a really unique part of the VB map. And it specifically looks at 24 different areas of learning barriers. So things that might be inhibiting the child's ability to learn or to maximize their progress. So by identifying those key barriers to that child's learning, you're able to really maximize your teaching. So by focusing on, for example, the child's problem behaviors first, then you're going to get those under control and then be able to better teach the child. So Mark Sundberg is the um, author, developer of the VB map, and he's going to be giving this workshop for us. And I think that he is an amazing speaker. I know people from all over the world um, have him come, and it's very, a really great opportunity to, to get to work with him. You get a copy of the VB map. You get the manual and the protocol book. Um, you get continuing education hours, um, depending on your discipline. Um, we have those available, and we can certainly look into trying to get them for your discipline if we don't already have them. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact Brooke LaMartina, our Outreach Coordinator, at brooke at autismcommunitynetwork-sa.org. Thanks. Okay, so the VB map. The VB map stands for Verbal Behavior Milestone Assessment and Placement Program. It was developed by Dr. Mark Sundberg. It's a skills assessment for students based on Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior. The assessment looks at students' development of typical language and learning milestones across verbal operands. And it's conducted every three to six months and excellent for ongoing tracking of language and learning skills. 
what is the purpose of the VB map? It identifies skills currently within the child's language and learning repertoires. The VB map tells us what skills the child currently has, what do they come to our school with, and where can we build on them, and what kind of portfolio individualized programs would best suit their needs, their educational needs to be exact. Determine priorities for intervention. If a child is not mastering a program at a proper rate, what kind of interventions can we put in place in order to help them? Identify what types of teaching strategies may be most beneficial for the child and determine what environment will best meet the child's learning needs. A lot of times our, our children cannot learn because there's too many distractions. So we have to really study and understand the environment that our students are in and what best environment would help them meet their educational needs and help them focus and learn. So the VB map is broken down into six components. Um, has anyone seen the VB map before? Let's go go back. Okay, so for some of this, this might be new to you, but it's always good to learn new things. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about the VB map. Yes, it is it's extremely helpful with writing goals and helping with curriculum guides. Okay, great. So some of you've seen it, some of you haven't. For those of you that have not seen it, you know, this will be something new for you. And for those of you that have seen it and use it in your schools and your classrooms, this will just be a review. So the VB map, which stands for Verbal Behavior Milestones and Placement Programs, is broken down into six components. The first component is the guide and protocol. The second component is the milestones assessment. The third component is the barriers assessment. The fourth is the transition assessment. The fifth is a skills task analysis and tracking. And the sixth and final one is the placement and IEP. Okay, so the first component is the VB map guide. It's an introductory guide. It basically tells you how to use the, the VB map. It gives you information of our global it gives you information about verbal behavior. It tells you what's it about, what it's used for, how to use it, how to incorporate verbal behavior in your classrooms and in your teaching. Definitions and examples of verbal operants. It breaks down the verbal operants like we discussed in this presentation. But this also tells you the materials that you need for assessments. A lot of times you need um, different materials, especially when you're doing a lot of tacting um, assessments, you need the, you need different pictures, different resources, different items. So you want to make sure that you have everything beforehand because when you're doing an assessment with a child and you're not prepared, they're not going to wait for you to get all the stuff you need. So just from experience, you want to make sure that before you're running the assessment, you're prepared with all the materials that you need in order to um, assess your students. The scoring guidelines, and it also talks about the curriculum, placement, and IEP goal suggestions for each level of the assessment. Continuation, the VB map protocol. Um, over here, you will find the master scoring grid, color-coded section for each milestone level and, accomp and accompanying task analysis. Here, you will find the earlier colleague skills assessment like we discussed before. You will find the barriers assessment and the transitions assessment. So for anyone who's not familiar with the VB map, I would suggest reading the guide and protocol just to give you a better idea of what the VB map is all about and how to use it effectively and efficiently. This is what a scoring guide looks like. The picture is not so great, it's a little blurry, but it's broken down into th three different levels. Level one is you're assessing skills um, within a zero to 18 month level. Level two is you're assessing skills within an 18 to 24 month level. And level three is your assessing skills within the 24 to 36 um, level. The VB map milestones assessment. This is the second part of the VB map. Here you will find um, a representative sample of a child's existing verbal and related skills. 
contains 170 measurable learning and language milestones across three different learning levels, like we discussed before. Zero to 18 months is level one, 18 to 30 is level two, 30 to 48 is level three. Now, a lot of times you will see that a child has um, most of his skills lie within the zero to 18 months, but he has splinter skills in different levels. These milestones are developmentally matched across these learning levels. By identifying milestones as opposed to a whole task analysis, the focus can be sharper and the direction can be clearer. Included in the milestones assessment in the early echoic skills assessment. So this is where you would find the um, early echoic skills assessment. Language and learning milestones. Um, in the assessment, these are some of the things you will be assessing. Man, tact, introvertible, echoic, and listener, independent play, visual perception skills and matching to sample, um, academic skills, reading, writing, math, group and classroom skills, and gram grammatical and syntactical skills. Those are more for higher level learners too. Then we have the VBMAP barriers assessment. It provides an assessment of 24 common learning and language acquisition barriers faced by children with autism. So what this assesses is if a child is not learning and mastering skills or developing language, what are some of the barriers that might be happening that are not allowing them to be able to progress educationally? Once a specific barrier has been identified, a more detailed functional analysis of that barrier is required. By identifying these barriers, the therapist can develop specific intervention strategies to help overcome these problems, which can lead to more effective learning. So once we realize why a child's not learning, we can be more efficient. If a child isn't learning because a program might be too hard, we would go ahead and scale that back and start with something easier. If a child needs more sensory input throughout the day, and maybe that's why he's not learning and a language not developing, we'd go ahead and provide it. So it's really important that we realize and that we, that we assess the, the barriers effectively because that could really hinder and you know, set a child back that's not developing appropriately with their language and communication skills. Some of the, um, the barriers that you might see in the VB map include behavioral problems, instructional control, impaired man, impaired tact, impaired motor imitation, impaired echoic. Um, they just keep on repeating everything we say, which is not allowing them to move forward and learn. Impaired match the sample, they have difficulty with visual perception um, skills, impaired introverbals, impaired social skills, prompt dependency, they're too um, dependent on your prompts. They're not, they're, not, they're not gaining independence and they're not moving on because they're so prompt dependent on um, on you and giving them the, um, the, the hint and the extra stimuli material that they need in order to respond. Scrolling, impaired scanning skills, a lot, of, um, a lot of the barriers include scanning skills. I have a lot of students who, they can't do simple matching or puzzles because they can't scan an array of three. Failure to make condition discriminations, they can't discriminate between objects, so that hinders their receptive skills and they get angry and they just get behavioral during those programs. And to generalize, a child might be able to label a certain toy in his classroom, but if he has the same toy at home, he can't do it. This is what a language barrier scoring form looks like. Transition assessment. It analyzes the skills needed to increase the probability that a student can successfully learn from a less restrictive setting. We want to make sure that the setting that the child is in is the most appropriate setting for him. A lot of our students start off in a smaller class size and in two years from now are able to be in a larger classroom size. So that's what the transition assessment assesses for. Is this student able to be in a less restrictive environment that he is currently in?
Phoebe Map Transition Assessment contains 18 assessment areas and can help to identify whether a child is making meaningful progress. The assessment looks at various items such as reinforced range, ability to complete independent work, rate of acquisition, self-help skills, and eating and toileting skills. So all of these are being assessed within the transition assessment to allow us to identify whether a child is able to be in a less restricted environment. Can the child be in a classroom with eight students if they are currently working in a classroom of six students? And these will be able to be assessed in the transition assessment. How independent can a child be? That's basically what this assessment is looking for. Can provide a measurable way for a child's IP team to make decisions about the child's educational needs. It's really important to be able to make the appropriate placement um, requests and recommendations for a child if he does need a less restrictive environment. The assessment includes measures of the overall score of the VV map, milestones assessment, and the overall score on the VV map barriers assessment. This is what a scoring form for the transition um, form looks like. They all look very similar. Now we have the VVMAP task analysis and skills training, provides a further breakdown of the skills into smaller sub goals. It serves as a more complete and ongoing learning and language skills curriculum guide. So in this category, you'll be able to take, for example, if you wanna teach a child how to brush their teeth, um, zipper their jacket, um, use the bathroom, you'll find a task analysis in this assessment and it will go ahead and break down the skill into simpler steps in order for you to teach your students. Because if you go ahead and just try to teach a child how to wash their hands by bombarding them with all the steps, they're not, it's gonna to be too difficult for them. Depending on the child, but most likely the easiest way to teach a child is by breaking down the skills into very, very small steps. Serves as a more complete and ongoing learning and language skills curriculum guide, I think I said that already allows for a more detailed skills tracking system and works to build a complete repertoire, not just individual skills. Once, right, so it, it's really building on skills like using the bathroom independently, being able to brush your teeth, being able to follow classroom routines, being able to tie your, um, tie your shoes, being able to zipper your coat, being able to be independent within your classroom environment. Once the milestones have been assessed and the general skill level has been established, the task analysis can provide further information about a particular child. So once you assess them in this specific assessment, you'll see what deficits they have, and then you could go ahead and in their individual programs, put that specific goal um, within the portfolio. So for example, if you have a child who has difficulty rubbing their hands together when you know washing their hands and using soap, you might go ahead and just isolate that specific goal work on that individually and then bring it back to the, the larger goal of doing washing hands as a, a routine. Provide parents and teachers with a variety of activities that can facilitate generalization, maintenance, spontaneity, retention, expansion, and the functional use of skills in a variety of educational and social contexts. Um, basically what that means is whatever you're doing at school, you wanna be able to help parents carry it over and generalize it at home. Yes, it's important for a child to know how to wash their hands at school, but it's just as important for a child to know how to wash their hands at home as well and in different settings, right? If a child is going to a restaurant, they need to wash their hands before they eat. So it's important they, they, they know how to generalize that one skill taught at school into different you know, settings in their environment. VB map placement and IEP goals, the final component of the VB map. It provides recommendations for program development for children based on their VB map profiles, scores for each child of 170 milestones and 24 barriers. So this basically gives you just an overall idea of where the child is um, educationally. Over 200 IEP objectives are directly linked to the skills and barriers assessments and a verbal behavior intervention program is provided. So, this is a great resource in terms of what skills and program development um, are appropriate for your students and provide suggestions for IP goals and Im implementation. Um, so some of the, oh, so 
we're at the end of our PowerPoint. Um, so conclusions. Um, I just wanted to conclude by, by saying a few points. Verbal behavior is a powerful tool used to teach children with autism language and communication skills. Um, Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior can guide an assessment and intervention program unlike any other theory of language. And the VB map is really important because it provides the foundation and the guide for an ABA VB intervention plan. Thank you.